Conservation planning are now part of the transportation planning process. The U.S. has about 700 wildlife crossings and more are on the way. These crossings are saving the lives of humans and animals, creating ecological corridors and saving millions of dollars. But how do you get started? Where do you find funding? And how do you know what will work in your particular situation? In this video, you will learn from colleagues in the field who are already dealing with these issues. Each section will provide examples of a different category of crossing and general lessons to draw from the examples. At the end, we will visit Montana to learn about the major US 93 project with its 42 varied crossing structures. But we'll start small, in Boonesboro, Maryland. turtles to two small drainage culverts. The Humane Society funded the materials and volunteers provided the labor. We've thought that even though the culverts are not, uh, not ideal for what a turtle would normally go for, um, that it was our only, our only uh, opportunity. So we set the silt fence up, you know, to lead the turtles, you know, right into that. And we installed cameras. Uh, into the culverts uh, for the first couple years and you know found that you know about 20 to 25 percent of the turtles that were observed along the barrier were in fact using the culverts to you know cross underneath the road. Based on that success Bartles secured a transportation enhancement program grant to install two wildlife specific culverts and a permanent fence. It's a, it's a good example of how an existing road can be retrofitted with relatively uh, low funds. Um, this grant is only $130,000 and um, you know, we feel that that will be more than you know, sufficient uh, to install the two culverts and permanent fencing along uh, 1.6 miles of roadway. Uh, this obviously was uh, put into place as a strictly temporary experimental uh, project um, and we've been lucky to get you know five years out of it. Um, the permanent fencing will consist of uh, PVC coated galvanized hardware cloth and it will have a uh, windscreen material attached to the inside portion of it, whatever the turtle will come up against, uh, because it has been found that if a turtle cannot see through the barrier, he won't try to get over the barrier or under the barrier. So um, if there's a visual uh, block there, he will be more inclined to follow along the uh, barrier and you know to the new culverts. The new culverts will be two feet diameter oval concrete culverts with natural bottoms located specifically for the turtles and other wildlife. Bartles expects to continue her almost daily patrols of the road to make sure everything works as planned. The Boonesboro project is significant because it shows the passion of one person and what that one person can do to make a difference. It also shows how you can use what's already there and retrofit it to where at least it provides a bit of functionality. In tough economic times, retrofitting is sometimes the only solution. It can be done in many different ways. These might include such things as uh, removing obstructions. Sometimes we have a, a massive amount of boulder armament there or riprap that makes it very difficult for some species to get through a structure, particularly culverts or, or bridges. We can make pathways through there. There's other ways we can, we can retrofit it. Um, if it's a, a bridge, maybe it's as simple as an old fence that is blocking the entrance. If we remove it, there you have it. You have one more structure that an animal can use. Oftentimes, the structures 
are usable with just a little bit of modification. And that's, that's the, the really huge value of retrofitting because the existing number of water conveyance structures out there now number literally in the hundreds of thousands. So if we can make those usable, then that's a very cost-effective approach. One very effective approach for small drainage culverts is the addition of shelves to provide a dry walkway for wildlife. When you have existing structures, sometimes you can create a dry unsubmerged surface with a, a new shelf. And that would be a retrofitted situation where you can actually add some type of material. Concrete is a, is a very good material to add. You could add a, a wooden shelf or a metal shelf. You don't want to obstruct the water flow through the structure, but you do want to provide for an unsubmerged surface for animals to walk on. A product developed by the University of Montana and manufactured by a local company offers one effective solution. The expanded metal here, the grating, allows for all species of uh, wildlife to move across this without any trouble. And then as a special feature that was uh, done through research that NDT helped fund, um, there is actually a bowl tube that is incorporated as part of the frame. And so the, the voles, because of their very nature, do not like to be exposed, uh, do actually heavily use these vole tubes. And so we are able to provide connection or connectivity uh, to wetlands on both sides of the road for virtually every species of small mammal that's present in these wetlands. Small culverts usually have a span of five feet or less and can be box culverts or metal pipes. Where moisture and light are important, the solid top can be replaced with a slotted grid. Slotted culverts were chosen for a spotted salamander crossing in Massachusetts. This project highlights the importance of incorporating moisture and light into a crossing, the use of species-specific fencing, and the need to think beyond the roadbed. We're in Amherst, Massachusetts on Henry Street and the location of the first salamander tunnels that were built in North America. This is a tunnel design that was developed in Europe and was brought to the U.S. And in 1987, we put a pair of these tunnels in at Henry Street to assist spotted salamanders moving from their overwintering grounds in the forest on the opposite side of the road to its wetland breeding grounds on this side. Spotted salamanders migrate at night in late winter, early spring, on wet, warm, rainy nights. And so wetness is a key trigger to their migration. So we were really interested to make sure that the tunnels were wet inside. So the design from Europe of having uh, tunnels with slotted tops to allow rainwater to get inside was really of interest to us because it would allow the inside to stay wet on migration nights. And it reduced the risk that salamanders would get partway through the tunnel and then find dry conditions and turn around and, and go back. Henry Street had been known for many years as a place where salamanders crossed the road, and local people had been working with town officials to close the road on big migration nights. So it was an area that was well known and got a fair amount of attention, and it looked like good site for uh, a test of this technology. The project moved ahead with tunnels donated by the manufacturer, support from several organizations, and lots of volunteers. The key issues for Jackson and his team were where to put the tunnels, how to structure the entranceways, how to deal with runoff, and how to design the fencing. Mesh fencing was chosen so that stormwater could flow through it. Of course, with a mesh fence, you have the problem that salamanders can easily climb up and over this because their toes get into the meshing quite easily. And so we crimped the top and then used little ties to keep it crimped along its entire length so that as animals come up from underneath and hit this roof, they then turn around and go back and then walk along the fence. So the Henry Street project was really an experimental project to try to learn as much as we could about the technique of using tunnels to move animals across the road and try to protect populations in that way. And some of the things about the site were not ideal. Uh, we didn't own the land on either side of it. 
And as a result, we are unable to put in permanent fences. The design that we have now requires annual maintenance to repair gaps in the fence, to make sure that it's standing up and, and is going to be functional when the salamanders migrate. By monitoring the tunnels, Jackson's team gathered data for use in future projects. Despite concerns, they found no evidence of adverse effects on the salamanders from road contaminants washing into the culverts. And they discovered by accident that the salamanders would like more light in the tunnels. They would mill around. Sometimes they'd go in, come out, go back in. Multiple false starts before they eventually crossed all the way to the other side. When a volunteer shone a flashlight into the tunnel, it eliminated all the hesitation and salamanders went very quickly and directly from one side to the other. And so now we look to a design that is also open top, but one that will create more light, um, that will provide more light in the tunnel and more airflow and moisture to try to maintain conditions favorable for migration. The evidence so far points to the idea that we may be able to use much smaller structures as long as we provide uh, open tops or otherwise allow lighting to get inside. So if you want to make uh, more effective structures for reptiles and amphibians, open tops are certainly an important consideration. If you're targeting one species, it's also important to think about all other species that may need to cross in that same location. And so even if your, uh, your target species is a snake and you don't need open tops for a snake, it might be worth considering open tops for all those amphibians that also need to cross in that same location. Medium underpasses allow for some openness and are generally for animals smaller than deer. They fall into three categories. Box culverts have four sides and are made of concrete or wood. Continuous culverts are rounded and can be made of corrugated metal pipe, known as CMP, metal, concrete, or wood. Open bottom culverts can be square or rounded and can also be made of CMP, metal, concrete, or wood. The maximum size for a medium culvert is usually eight feet by eight feet. A suite of medium culverts and associated structures was used very effectively on US 441 in Florida, where it crosses the Paynes Prairie State Preserve. Thousands of animals from more than 80 species were being killed each year as they crossed the road to mate and forage. Most were frogs, turtles, and snakes. In 1997, a coalition of state transportation and natural resource agencies, environmental groups, and the University of Florida met to brainstorm solutions. This retrofit standalone project highlights the effectiveness of coalitions and partnerships and the importance of monitoring creative design and planning for maintenance. To me, the, one of the most amazing things about the, the, the Paynes Prairie Eco Passage is that it, it wasn't built to protect threatened and endangered species. It was really kind of a paradigm shift, a quantum change in the way the Florida Department of Transportation was thinking about this. And I, I really believe that, that Florida DOT deserves all the credit here. I mean, it was these people who decided they were going to spend this money to build this eco passage. So they were just going out of their way to make sure that the community structure in Paynes Prairie maintained its integrity and that we no longer had these thousands and thousands of animals killed every year. So really it was, it was a grassroots effort. Uh, people um, brought it to the attention of DOT and then they didn't give up. They, they uh, wrote letters, they contacted um, local representatives of the government and uh, they made a good case for doing something about this. And DOT saw it as an opportunity to do something. For us it was a little bit experimental. We hadn't done anything like this in North Florida before and, and so there was an opportunity to work together with the Painsbury Coalition as well as other people. The design of the Eco Passage itself was a real collaborative process. I mean, between biologists and road engineers and trying to see how can we build this thing. So the first thing that was done is we contacted zoo people because they're experts at containing wildlife. Um, and an Eco Passage always has those two components. One component to keep the animals off the roadway and a second to get them safely underneath. Um, so the culverts under that let the animals move underneath the, the highway were a real serious limitation for us because we have fluctuating water levels here. And in fact, we have actually come really close to almost flooding the highway on several occasions. And so the design of, 
of that part of the system was really constrained by what we could do with getting a, a culvert under that roadway and still not cause damage to the roadbed. The final project design consists of two existing 6x6 culverts at each end of the two-mile stretch, two existing 9x9s in the middle, and four new 36-inch concrete pipes added each half mile. These were placed above potential flood level using a jack-and-bore method and ensure wildlife passage at all times. And we found that, uh, like we know that coyotes, coyote-sized animals are using the 6x6 uh, six six boxes and alligators are using those also. We observed a river otter coming out of one of the 36 inch round concrete pipes and we have documentation of other smaller animals, raccoon, possum size uh, creatures getting through the, the boxes and then also uh, depending upon the, um, what the hydrology of the prairie is doing when the, when the six by six boxes are wet, uh, we, we see frogs actually living inside of those but we know that they're using them also to get from one side to the other. So we think that there's sufficient opportunity for wildlife to pass under the roadway. A specially designed wildlife barrier was a critical part of the project. All right, what we're looking at here is the, the concrete wall itself, the barrier wall, and this is a precast structure that was cast off-site and brought to this location and installed. We thought that was a better way of doing it, uh, less environmental damage on site. We didn't have to build forms and pour concrete on site. But one of the aspects of this wall is that we added a, a lip of six inches in thickness and six inches in, in width over the edge of the wall to add as a um, a deterrent for those animals that were pretty good climbers. And it worked wonderfully well. Um, I remember when we were working with uh, contractors who were making the wall, I learned something very key at that point, and that was engineers love a challenge. And so the engineers in the consulting company said, we've never made such smooth concrete. It was really a challenge for us to try and figure out how to make it slippery enough that a snake couldn't get up and around it. And so it made me realize we're all on the same team. Maintenance issues also played into the design choices, taking into account Florida's long growing season. And so, you know, right now you can see that we do need to do some vegetation control. The thing is, it, it's, it's difficult when you have a, a barrier wall like this, you've got to consider some kind of access to the habitat side of the wall as well as the roadway side of it. And that can be kind of difficult here on the prairie. Uh, we can't put um, people on, on the ground here most of the time because there, there is a, you know, some danger from venomous snakes and alligators. And so that leaves a, really a mowing equipment that's on an articulated arm that can reach over the top of the wall. The machine can be driven down along the top of the wall and the, and the mowing arm can come over. Uh, you can also use approved herbicides to um, treat the vegetation at certain times. Aesthetics were also taken into account in the design. The barrier wall was constructed to leave the view of the prairie unobstructed, but that created an unexpected hazard for the public. Drivers started pulling over to watch the alligators. So in an effort to protect the alligators from the people and the people from the alligators and to maintain a safe roadway condition, we constructed a, a four-foot field wire fence uh, along the right-of-way to keep people from getting on top of the wall. and. Uh, Amazingly, it, it solved the problem. We still have a few people that pull off and, and uh, take a look, but it's nothing like it was before where people could, could get right up and close to these big alligators. But in general, the, uh, the, the eco passes are working really well, and instead of uh, seeing a multitude of carcasses as you drive across the prairie, you, you don't see anything now. So we know that it's been very effective. Human safety remains the primary reason for installing large underpasses. It is estimated that one to two million wildlife vehicle collisions with large animals happen every year. Most of them are with deer or other large ungulates. Approximately 200 people are killed and 29,000 injured annually in deer collisions alone. Investing in crossing structures for deer and other large species saves lives and millions of dollars in property damage and liability. Deer require underpasses that provide visibility, room to maneuver, and some moderated noise.
That usually means a minimum 20-foot span by 8-foot rise, although a 10-foot by 10-foot box culvert can work in some situations. The actual design can be critical. In Utah, Patricia Kramer compared two sets of culverts with monitoring cameras. One set goes straight under four lanes of traffic for 160 feet, and the other set is broken by a median, creating 60-foot tunnels. The camera showed a dramatic difference in success rate for mule deer crossings. And so um, I found that um, the culverts that are 160 feet long, those have been in since 1995, so the animals have had almost 15 years to adapt to them. Yet I've had a 34% repel rate where the, the deer, mule deer, came to the entrance, looked around, and in part the camera was to blame for that repel rate. But the animals turned around and went away and did not enter it. So 34% of all the animals that came to this culvert turned around and went away. Then the set of culverts where there's an open median, I have the cameras on both places. The animals are looking at the cameras too. It's not like they're completely hidden. And I have maybe a 2% repel rate, very, very low. And so I need more data and I, and I I'm, you know, good scientist doesn't say this is the facts, but what I'm finding right now is animals don't like going through a long dark tunnel if they're a prey species in particular. With limited resources, particularly money, we need to make some hard choices about such things as how many and what type of crossing structures to install. One of the things we don't know is what is the best choice, whether to have one or two very, very good and very effective structures such as large overpasses or very long extended bridges, or use that limited funding for a much numerous array of less perfect structures. In Arizona, the four-laning of Highway 260, east of Payson, provided an opportunity to install 11 large wildlife crossings and six bridges along a 17-mile stretch of road. The project is considered a model for corridor planning and also highlights the importance of early planning, fencing, escape structures, and adaptive management. Along State Route 260, we had an elk vehicle collision problem. Elk were trying to get to these riparian meadows and they would be hit by cars and the problem was increasing as traffic volumes increased. State Route 260 had an opportunity to be upgraded and in the planning phases 10 to 15 years ago, they started to implement wildlife crossing structures to help accommodate elk across the road while also reducing elk vehicle collisions. This also helped other wildlife when they did this. The Highway 260 project was a wonderful laboratory in which to uh, uh, allow me to experimentate and ADOT and FHWA were wonderful partners in relation to allowing that adaptive management to take place. So that earlier in the process and the projects, uh, we learned numerous types of uh, uh, things about wildlife and uh, the connectivity issues associated with the wildlife, uh, whether it be the fencing or whether it be the bridge type or whether it be the abutments, and took that learning process and adapted the future projects uh, to incorporate what we had learned in the earlier projects in most cases where these crossing structures have been placed would have been culverts just for water flow. But because of the issues with wildlife and wild, keeping wildlife movement across the road, they took these culverts and made them larger structures such as open span bridges so they would function as both water and wildlife structures. This structure is Sharp Creek Bridge. This was an area where Department of Transportation needed to put in something for the water flow anyway. This creek flows year round and they made this structure so it not only allowed the water to flow but left the edges open to allow wildlife to also travel through here. This is a very good structure. Uh, we get all kinds of wildlife through it. There's cover throughout the whole area and um, it's one of the better structures we have along 260 for passing various kinds of wildlife. Along State Route 260 at Little Green Valley we've got two structures that are side by side. It gave us an opportunity to evaluate different types of structures. Early on we had one structure that wasn't being used as much as the other one. The one that wasn't being used had ledges. The animals would come in, they'd look up on the ledges, and they would not want to go through, versus the one just down the way from it, about a football field's length, the animals were going through it regularly, and it had natural slopes. 
we recommend that you don't put you try and avoid ledges because of the predator response that the prey species have as they go through there what we did find over time is even that structure began to get used regularly as we saw generation after generation of elk go through we started to see that structure function just as well as the one next to it if a structure is not perfectly designed or placed in an area that's preferable for wildlife it takes a little bit longer for wildlife to get used to them one of the keys to making them work is funnel fencing funnel fencing forces them to those structures and then over time they start to get used to them as they encounter them and go through them become more comfortable and we'll start to use them regularly here on state route 260 we've seen most of our structures become equally effective after about four years and about 80 percent of the animals that come up to these structures go through the project uses a variety of funnel fencing elk are good jumpers so elk fences need to be at least eight feet high in some places, new wire mesh ungulate proof fencing was installed. In others, existing fences were retrofitted up to the eight foot mark. Where necessary, the retrofitting included electric wires across the top. Fencing along the alignment was a concern uh, in the maintenance of those uh, fences uh, by ADOT. And what we looked at was uh, the utilization of large riprap to be a boundary between where the animals could be and where the animals could not be and use that instead of a, uh, instead of a, a hard wire fence uh, in certain locations and they were very ex much more expensive than the, uh, uh, than the fences themselves but they are maintenance free. Uh, may not work very well in snow country because uh, the snow goes over the rock uh, and uh, the animals can step over them but uh, in uh, territory or uh, uh, ecosystems like Arizona, they seem to work out very well. Even a well-designed fence has vulnerable areas, such as driveways, exit ramps, or fence ends, and some animals will end up on the highway. Escape structures are an important part of any crossing that uses fencing. Also known as escape ramps or slope jumps, these structures direct animals off the roadway to safety. They are generally located near the vulnerable areas and they are usually designed for a specific species. In other words, an escape structure for turtles is very different from one designed for elk or moose. Escape ramps are the most effective way to allow elk to get out of the right of way. We need to make sure that they're high enough that they can't jump in, but not too high that they won't jump out. What we found for elk is about six feet is good to allow them out and not let them back in. When you place the jump at a height that's higher than their eye level and they can't look up on it, they don't tend to jump up on it, but they still will use it effectively getting out of the right of way. The scope of the 260 project has allowed for lessons learned on early structures to be implemented on later crossings. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some jump outs down below here and we changed some features there also as far as how we were tying the, uh, uh, the fencing into the abutments as well as uh, the types of materials we use. We're using a concrete material here rather than the pressure treated wood materials that we had used earlier. These will be far less maintenance uh, heavy. Slope jumps have proved to be effective escape mechanisms in some locations, but one-way gates have been less successful. The animals bypass them in favor of escape ramps further along the right-of-way. In general, one-way gates have been found to be eight times less effective than ramps. Fencing presents its own set of problems. For instance, it can require a lot of maintenance, especially in snowy areas. It also creates an opportunity for end runs where the barrier finishes. The best situation is to end the fence, which is diverting animals and keeping them off the highway, end that at a place where the animals no longer want to be. Another method of dealing with end runs is, is to end it at a straight stretch and that allows drivers to be able to take a little bit more responsibility and say okay I now I can see that there are, are animals possible on the roadway and to and to see and avoid. That's not a really great solution because of course that's one of the reasons why we put in fences and, and crossing structures to start with. The Highway 260 corridor is really significant because it was the first major effort to try adaptive management on transportation ecology in the U.S. And what we mean by that is we tried several things that we didn't know were, 
going to work perfectly, but we did try them. Another really good take home message, one that is substantial for every highway is that traffic volume is a great predictor of impacts. And we know from some of the work that has been done on elk responses to traffic volume that there, there, that is going to be a very useful tool that we can use to help us determine where trigger points are for impacts and also to determine what, what appropriate mitigation would be. On State Route 68 in Arizona, wildlife crossings are being installed for bighorn sheep. The Federal Highway Administration, Arizona's DOT, and Game and Fish Departments and other federal agencies are all collaborating on the project. The FHWA funded research on the sheep herd and is also the major construction funder. In the past, Game and Fish was always coming at us at 95% design. Hey, we want a bridge. Too late. Now they're involved at the very beginning. My own personal opinion, I think the best thing to come out of this, we got a win-win for the sheep and the traveling public from a safety perspective. The biggest win for me personally is, is the relationship between Federal Highway, ADOT, Game and Fish. It's become a much more solid partnership than it's ever been before. All road construction has an impact beyond the actual right of way, but with early planning, some of the extended disruption can be converted into assets. A necessary part of the construction of any project are uh, the contractor's activities and needs. Uh, typically, uh, they are not thought about uh, at the time of design because they're always needed uh, by any contractor. Uh, but uh, I've taken an opportunity with these types of impacts to incorporate them into the design and the long-term management of the area. Uh, identification of areas for staging areas that we later on use for uh, a trailhead or a day-use facility uh, near the water areas that we span or put the bridge in for. Uh, those are areas that the public wants to be and so that uh, the utilization of those disturbance areas by the contractor and then remediation and final usability of those sites uh, has been uh, very rewarding for me. Uh, borrowing waste is another one as far as uh, uh, the projects often need uh, additional borrow material and so what can, uh, where can we dig a hole? Well, if you need a watering hole for uh, wildlife, that's an a great opportunity to develop that and develop a win-win situation. Uh, if you've got to get rid of material, oftentimes we have uh, waste sites or, or dumping sites that we may wish to remediate and uh, uh, essentially rehab uh, the, the area and that often can be done as a part of this construction project. <music>Although most large crossings are built for ungulates, an increasing number are being installed for other species. The first major transportation project of this type targeted the endangered Florida panther along a 40-mile stretch of I-75 known as Alligator Alley. In the first decades when we started making wildlife crossings in the 70s and 80s, and, and still today, we were convinced that we needed to put in a crossing to keep the deer, the elk, the moose off the road for the safety of the motorist. Um, that's great and that will continue to be so, but in the 80s we started to realize that we had other animals out there on the landscape that were getting killed by cars or that they were being completely cut off from the rest of their habitat and movement patterns by the road and the berm that the road was on. And so in the 1980s, around 1985, when Alligator Alley in Florida, um, Interstate 75 was um, upgraded to a four-lane highway, 24 box culverts and, and additional other corrugated steel culverts were put in predominantly for the Florida panther but also for other species and that was the beginning of the multiple species target species crossings I think in in the North America. I've been here since 1989 so I was here watching the whole alligator alley being converted over to a four-lane interstate highway and of course the refuge was established in 89 and these crossings are really uh, made so that these animals can egress and digress uh, from the refuge. Before this wildlife crossing was actually completed, when they're actually uh, building it and traffic was being routed around this, there are cameras set up underneath this and we are tracking cats, turkey, 
bear or deer. Just about everything you'd normally see in the woods walking underneath this wildlife crossing or what was soon to be a completed wildlife crossing. And thereafter, when it was completed, nothing had changed. The cats and other animals keep walking back and forth under this crossing. One important thing to remember though is here is a crossing that was put here because we had data that showed that this was already a travel lane for cats and other wildlife anyway. So it just made sense. This is where we need to put the crossing. The Alligator Alley project also included 12 bridge extensions, which provide a dry pathway for wildlife 30 to 40 feet wide next to water. Bridge extensions offer multiple benefits for accommodating flood flows and allowing for wildlife and aquatic passage. When we are replacing bridges, all those bridges that will need to be replaced across the, the country in the not too distant future, this is something that we want to try to include whenever possible because of the multiple benefits. Since completion of all the I-75 crossings in 1993, there have been no panther deaths along the 40-mile stretch of I-75. However, as this project ages, there are concerns about rising water levels in the culverts, increasing traffic volume, and other issues. Florida has also installed crossings targeted at Black Bear. One of them goes under State Road 46, where animals were being killed as they crossed over to the Wakiva River Basin. The dirt floor box culvert is 47 feet long by 24 feet wide by 8 feet high. The two-lane road was elevated to give the bears a clear view to the other side. This crossing provides a way to link bear habitat, creating the larger area the black bear needs to survive. Some situations dictate an at-grade solution to allow animals to cross a road safely or to keep them out of the right-of-way. At-grade crossings are an active area of research right now and we're trying to figure out under what circumstances they would be suitable to use. They're a desirable system to use because they are considerably cheaper than any of the either underpasses or overpasses, unless the underpasses are already there for water conveyance, in which case there really is a very, sometimes no extra expense in order to modify them for wildlife use. But at-grade crossings are really useful in places where there's, very, uh, there's many access roads or it's a more urbanized area. Uh, those sorts of situations make it difficult to have underpasses or overpasses. So if we can get a handle on at-grade crossings, then we can apply that, that mitigation measure in a lot of locations we currently are not mitigating at all. Currently, there are two main choices for at-grade crossings. A crossing area can be designated for wildlife and signs posted to warn drivers, but this is not always effective. Or a roadway animal detection system can be installed. A RADS is now in place on Arizona Highway 260. Sensors detect the wildlife and trigger flashing lights to alert drivers. Monitoring has shown RADS to be moderately successful and a good solution where an under or overpass is not feasible for topographic or cost reasons. Side access roads also need at-grade solutions to keep wildlife off a main highway. There are a couple ways that you can keep animals from getting on the road while still allowing cars to pass. We'll use dual cattle guards in some cases and we'll use electromats in some cases. This effectively keeps animals from crossing into the road while allowing vehicles to access the side roads. Dual cattle guards are being used end to end because elk are able to jump the length of a single guard. Numerous other at-grade techniques have also been tried to prevent wildlife vehicle collisions. Lighting, intercept feeding, and repellents have limited effectiveness. Equipment, such as reflectors, deer whistles, and flagging signs installed to deflect animals from the roadway, and structures designed to change driver behavior, such as warning signs and speed bumps, have had inconsistent results. In general, the strategies that target wildlife are more successful than those that target drivers. Overpasses are the preferred crossing type in many situations, but they are also the most expensive. The history of wildlife overpasses might be considered the history of adaptive management for transportation ecology. It was recognized early on that 
Some animals are going to have a hard time behaviorally in going under the highway because of the necessity of it being an enclosed surface. And so the overpass idea came up early on in transportation ecology. The first overpasses in the 1970s were very simple or combined human and animal traffic. Eventually, once we got to the uh, 1990s, we started looking at what would a really, really perfect design be? And that's when we started looking at growing plants as well as just having, having animals cross over the top of the highway. And once you incorporated the idea of growing plants on a wildlife overpass, that completely changed the way that we approached it because that allowed for a miniature ecosystem. And that's one of the reasons why it actually is a, is a good system for many species that won't use underpasses because it provides for ambient temperature, it provides for ambient light, it provides for some moisture, and of course the plants that these, these species depend on. North America's first major overpasses were constructed in the mid-1990s in Canada's Banff National Park, where the Trans-Canada Highway cuts through the Bow River Valley. The first overpasses in Banff, which were completed in 1997, were designed by Parks Canada. At that time, the uh, Trans-Canada Highway was believed to be a barrier to car large carnivore movements. So really the first uh, aspect of the design that was important for, for these overpasses was the width. And, um, they decided to go with 50 meters based on uh, conversations with uh, transportation departments in Europe that that was really uh, the minimum width for uh, overpasses uh, that would allow passage for large carnivore species. Uh, our monitoring has been going on now for, for almost 15 years and that information has been instrumental in determining the placement of the four new overpasses that are being built on the trans canada Highway today. The BAMP system of overpasses and underpasses is proving very successful. Multi-year monitoring has shown that the effectiveness of structures increases over time. Ungulate vehicle collision has been reduced by 96% along the highway, and all animal vehicle collisions have been reduced by 80%. To answer the question about uh, the population level benefits of these crossing structures. We started a study in 2006, a three-year study that looked at grizzly bear and black bear movement at the crossing structures by collecting hair of these individuals that are using the crossings. So by obtaining the DNA, we were able to identify individuals, identify the gender, by sampling uh, also the grizzly and black bear population around these crossing structures, we're basically able to determine how many individuals are using the crossings, uh, what their genders are, how they're related, and whether or not learning has been, been passed on from, from mothers to, to offspring. And this is really important to determine really the conservation value of crossing structures because uh, a lot of movement is, is an indicator of, of to some extent of success, but you really need to determine how populations are benefiting with regards to uh, demographics and, and genetics. As biologists, one of the things that we are charged with doing is maintaining healthy populations of animals now and in the future. And in order to do that, we need to figure out whole systems strategically, how we can, how we can design a, an ecological infrastructure. That's, that's a lot more challenging than just putting in wildlife crossing structures or fencing in certain places. We need to be able to do it strategically with a well thought out and connected, integrated purpose. One of the best examples of road ecology and corridor planning so far is a 57-mile stretch of US-93 on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana. As traffic increased along the highway during the 1980s, the number of wildlife vehicle collisions became critical. White-tailed deer, mule deer, and black bear were most commonly involved, and occasionally grizzly bear. In the early 90s, the Montana Department of Transportation and the Federal Highways Administration approached the Consolidated Salish and Kootenai Tribes about a major road improvement project. 
The tribes had concerns about the cultural and natural impacts of the construction. It became obvious that an environmental impact statement for the entire corridor was necessary instead of environmental assessments for each part. That study was completed by the mid-90s. However, the tribes still had concerns about the scope of the construction, favoring an improved two-lane over a divided four-lane highway. After a few false starts at negotiations, all the parties met again in 1999. With the help of an engineering design firm and a landscape architect, a new plan was developed over the course of a year which answered most of the tribe's concerns. An agreement was signed in December 2000 and a three-year design process followed. Well, the unique thing about Highway 93 is that through a, an agreement between three governments, federal highways, the federal government, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, and the state government, Montana, we came to an agreement on how the road was going to fit into the landscape. And that's a very different way of doing business for MDT. And so it involved a completely different way of thinking about how you design a road, blend it into the landscape, not only meet your needs for safety and traffic flow, but also the needs of the wildlife. So we tried to look at designs that would basically accommodate a whole suite of species from small mammals and amphibians up through things like grizzly bears, elk, and moose. We biologists knew biology pretty well and the landscape engineers knew landscape uh, architecture pretty well. And the engineers were good engineers and so we had a number of um, sessions. We met usually twice a month for a day. I worked with the design firms for the various segments as we went. And um, I think uh, some of us from each of the disciplines, I, I remember hearing say, this is the fun part of the project. You know, This is where we actually get to figure out how to put these things on a landscape and, and make them work. And uh, you know, we weren't we weren't always in agreement, and we had a few uh, good debates. But by and large, it was a great working relationship that I think all of us enjoyed and, and benefited from. The final plan for this phase consists of 42 wildlife crossing structures. Most of the structures are large oval culverts, approximately 12 feet high by 22 feet wide. But there are also smaller culverts, seven extended bridges, and one overpass. Funnel fencing and wildlife-friendly livestock fencing are included, as well as wetland mitigation. Construction funding came from the FHWA and MDT. Montana sold bonds to cover most of the MDT portion. The tribes also contributed by allocating staff throughout the process. The largest single project is the overpass. The design was a creative solution suggested by the contractor, which saved over $2 million. This wildlife overpass is a prefabricated structure called a Bebo structure. And basically the footings are cast in place and then they bring in prefabricated arches and bring them in half at a time and set them in and attach them to build the tunnel and it's built in sections. Now the reason we could go with a prefabricated structure in this particular location is because we had to build up the earth on both sides so they have equal weight loading on both sides of the structure. This is a view of the newly constructed overpass. Um, it was completed in the early summer of 2010. We're in the fall right now. And so at this part you can see that we haven't done a lot of revegetation at this point. There are small trees that have started to be replanted and in a few years, there'll actually be some cover. Some larger ones will be planted in this area to provide some, cur some shade and um, protection right now. But at this point right now, we're just at the small um, vegetation. This specific overpass right here is going to have a green screen is what we're calling it, where instead of having it built up with earth to abate the sound, there's gonna be vegetation, a more mature vegetation set up here to sort of break up the visual and to reduce the sound. 
to put an earthen berm that's tall enough to do that same function on this area would start to create more of a load on top of the structure below, which could cause issues of too much loading on the top and could compromise the structure at some point. The cost of any individual structure oftentimes is a focal point for concern. How much did the thing cost to build? But if we look at most of these, uh, most of them are in riparian areas and some fairly substantial structure would have to be placed there regardless. Some of the bridge structures that uh, are now being put in place or have been put in place replaced very small inadequate culverts that cause flooding problems and we were looking at not only an antiquated highway on the road surface but uh, within the, the base of the road itself. Monitoring is an important part of the overall project. Sand tracking beds were used pre-construction and that information was combined with roadkill data and engineering and topographical studies to determine the locations of the crossing structures. Post-construction monitoring consisting of sand beds and cameras is now underway. These cameras are pretty nice. They're infrared motion sensing cameras. We have them set up to take 20 photos per event. As soon as it starts to see that there's something in the, um, in the area or it starts detecting some motion, then it starts to, it immediately shoots 20 shots off. And then if whatever's in front of the camera continues to be there, it will continue to shoot off photos. This one I'm changing right now in the month of July. We filled up a four gigabyte disk in half the month. So we're making sure that we don't lose photos for the next month. We use lithium batteries. They're supposed to last the longest. These ones have been lasting six months at a time. We've got our motion sensor here, our filtered flash, and our lens right here. Monitoring of the crossing structures, jump outs, and fence ends will continue until 2015, and the data will be used for a cost-benefit analysis. Monitoring so far shows that the crossing structures are working as planned for all the targeted species and other wildlife in the area. In my personal opinion as a biologist, personally, I feel like it's successful at this point. On the engineering side, some lessons learned will be applied to later crossings. For instance, the heating and cooling in this complete corrugated metal pipe threatens the integrity of the concrete baffles along the stream bed. But the point is, is that if we were to look at doing something like this again, maybe what we should take another look at is the possibility of going with a bottomless arch. And then you could build a natural channel design through the bottomless arch to have your stable grade and stable stream system. And uh, constructability would be a little easier. Uh, because you would not be putting the concrete baffles in and um, it might also help with the cost. So, you know, that was just one of the lessons we learned as we we're going through this and kind of looking at it now in hindsight. There's nothing wrong with this, it's just things you learn as you go. In another location, stream erosion is threatening a concrete walkway through a structure. We no longer use solid material for our walkways under our bridges because of erosional forces that undercut the solid path. We now use natural material from the stream area of cobble, gravel, and sand compacted in, and that is our pathway. We still could do some tweaking on uh, the road that's been constructed, add some more fences, a few other things like that. But we're seeing animals actually use the structures, um, quite a number of different species. Uh, and that's just in the initial monitoring, so I think by the time our big monitoring project is completed, uh, we'll have a pretty impressive data set that will show any, anyone else that might be a skeptic that, yeah, these things actually do work. The things for me that is my favorite is the fact that I get to see all this wildlife that we know that we have here, but we don't get to see all the time. And we definitely don't want to see it dead on the highway. So if it's using a crossing structure, it's a successful crossing and it's still alive. The Highway 93 projects were integral in shaping 
how the department has to rethink how we design and build roads away from the traditional way of just blacktop and fill. It's blending the road into the landscape, meeting the needs for traffic flow and safety, but also wildlife. All over the country, other exciting corridor projects are now underway, like the upgrading of I-90 Snoqualmie Pass East in Washington. This stretch of highway will be expanded from four to six lanes and will incorporate some of the most innovative highway crossing facilities for wildlife in North America. I think people have realized that they want to have safe highways and rapid transportation and, and efficient transport of goods and services, but they also very much value their wildlife. Scientists have started to recognize that this is a very interesting and, and useful topic and that we can make a big difference in our lives. We can, we can actually get animals safely across the highway just like we can get people across the highway. And we want to do that. I see the future of transportation ecology as being a place where we can allow animals to move freely across the landscape just as we have been able to do with our very fantastic transportation systems. It's something that we want to do and we should do and I think we are actually doing. <laughs>